Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Uh, Welcome to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm not even sure that I'm getting through to you guys. I'm just wondering if you're hearing me at all right now. Uh, This is disturbing. I'm not getting back anything from Skype. Let me ask here. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Folks, I'm going to assume that I'm being heard which I think may be a bad assumption at this point because my Skype connection doesn't look too good. Let me um, play a little bit of a clip here, and then I'll try to see how things are going. So hang in there. I appreciate it. This little boy is referred to as Sam in case studies. A year and a half before he was born, his grandfather died. When he was about 18 months old, his dad was changing his diaper one day, and and Sam looked up at him and said, when I was your age, I used to change your diaper. Since 1996, Dr. Jim Tucker, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia, has been gathering case studies of past life recognition in children that could prove that a soul returns to Earth in another body. We've now got 2,500 cases in our files from all over the world. Many people believe in some form of reincarnation. The concept dates back to 800 B.C. and the Hindu Upanishads. Beginning in India, the belief that some essential part of ourselves may return after death to a new body is now being examined by some scientists as another way to prove the survival of consciousness. Can the study of past life recollections support this theory? The answer may lie within young children's memories. Very young children, usually between the age of two or three, who start reporting that they have memories from having had a past life. Some of them talk about being deceased relatives, but others will talk about being strangers in other locations. And if they give enough details, like the name of the other location, people have often gone there and found that, in fact, someone had died in in the recent past whose life matches the details that the children gave. Well, folks, I'm connected via Skype, and I'm not getting any response from my Skype, so I'm going to play uh, a clip here and then uh, call in with the phone. The spirit form. What is it? What is its purpose? Here is an overview. In order to evolve, the creation creates the human spirit form. And this spirit form, in turn, evolves independently through the human being's material consciousness. Prior to entering the human being for the first time, the spirit form is an absolutely neutral energy agglomeration in timeless existence and is totally unknowing. Once it enters into the human being, its goal is to collect wisdom, knowledge, love, etc. through countless reincarnations to eventually merge with the creation, whereby the creation has the possibility to further evolve. Just for clarity of terminology, here's a brief explanation of what the creation is, taken from the Decalogue by Billy Meyer. The creation is the being and the non-being of the life. It is the most immense mass of spiritual energy in the universe. It is spirit in purest form and unmeasurable in its wisdom, in its knowledge, in its love, and in its harmony and truth. The creation is something spiritually dynamic, a pure spirit intelligence energy, ungraspable for human beings, prevailing. 
normal folks, I had to call back in via telephone. I wasn't getting any response from my Skype. I wasn't even sure if you were able to hear anything I said there at the beginning of the show. Apologize for that. Uh, welcome to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. You were just listening to a clip called Reincarnation in the Spirit Form uh, by Michael Udebrook from Figu Canada. He's got a lot of great um, films that he's done out there related to the Meyer information. Um, he was talking about creation. Creation is also called the universal consciousness. It's a neutral, positive entity. It creates spirit forms as a part of its own evolution. It's neither good nor evil. It really doesn't have a personality in the sense that we think of a personality at all. It, it's a super intelligence. It's not a heavenly father. In fact, it it still radiates love, but it's in its nature, it functions very automatically. It has a predetermined evolutionary plan that covers trillions and trillions and trillions of years. The, the, the universal consciousness doesn't really correspond to our notion of God. Our religions have used the term God, and God kind of... Uh, it makes anthropomorphic this uh, spirit that's really rather impersonal in the way it functions. It creates human spirit forms to help it with its own evolution. And human spirit forms, uh, we all have one. The spirit form resides in your superior colliculus, which is an area in your middle brain, in your midbrain, the area that controls sight, and it's your spiritual consciousness. And there's something that controls your spiritual consciousness. It's called the Gemut. And the Empfinden in the German is the process that goes on in that spiritual consciousness, the spiritual process. And part of the spiritual process that goes on in your spiritual consciousness is... Um, related to this fine, sensitive feeling that you can get when you start to sense the radiating love of creation. Creation radiates love, and you can sense that radiating love because love is the highest principle in all creation, and everything follows that principle in absolute logic. Every tiny plant Every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. Love is a creational natural law. It's kind of like gravity. It is the primary creational natural law. And if you can associate your life and orient it to that creational natural law, it will help you in your day-to-day -day life. Another and very important creational natural law is the law of striving and that's work and staying focused on your work and putting your best effort into your work and and um, everything in nature strives the, the tree strives to grow the plants grow the animals work in order to stay alive the human being also has to work and strive and the principle of striving, the way you can apply this to your life is focus your life in such a way that you're focused on your day job. I mean, take care of business there. Uh, if it means working overtime, if it means getting to work early, if it means to doing some on the on the weekends as well, focus on evolving your consciousness, learning more. Taking in, you know, studying the Meyer material, reading other books. The flip side of that is becoming idle. And the worst thing that you should and do, you should never become idle. And you shouldn't become lazy. One of the things we, we do, we're all guilty of it, I know I am, is allowing yourself to be entrained by the electronic media that is in the world here. And it, it really it interrupts our sense of striving. It interrupts uh, the creational natural law of love. And the third law, 
the creational natural law that the Billy Meyer material talks about is the law of harmony. And the law of harmony says that you have to keep a neutral positive thought process at all times, neutral positive, not too positive, not too negative. And you have to monitor your thoughts because your thoughts really create the circumstances for your life. Out of your thoughts come the circumstances of your life. We don't realize that. But the incredible power of our thoughts. Now, some of the power comes from subconscious and unconscious thoughts. And it's that's one of the dangers, is there's a lot of power in our subconscious thoughts. And we don't even realize we have subconscious and unconscious thoughts. So be very aware of what you're thinking, because you can bring a reality into being that you're not ready for and you don't want. And there's also a time delay. Thoughts that you had six months ago can be affecting what's going on in your life right now. So never underestimate the power of your own thinking and the power of your own thoughts. Well, I I gave a title to the show today, um, and it's related to really last week's show, and it talks about uh, Jehovah. Now, I've been um, in in occasional dialogue with some Jehovah's Witnesses who like to stop by, and uh, I like to put out, point out things that people may not be aware of. Uh, particularly in the Bible, and and I'm not anti-Bible, and I'm not anti-religion, and I'm not anti-Christianity, and I don't want to come off that way. But there are certain things that appear in our Bible that are very strange, and we tend to gloss over them very much. Now, in Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth. Interesting here, we gloss right over it. Let us make man in our image, plural. The word here is Elohim. Um, I don't think it refers to a trinity. Um, You know, the, the concept of the trinity, I think, is something that was kind of invented to to explain these passages, to explain these things. And I don't really follow along with the Zechariah Sitchin point of view either, but um, let us make man in our image. Let's um, I'm gonna put that on hold because I want to jump to chapter three where the things are become real obvious. And I don't want to spend that much time here anyway because um, uh, we have Adam and Eve and uh, they have a son, two sons, one called Cain and one called Abel. Um, Cain kills Abel. And then a few verses and chapters later, we find out that Cain is laying with his wife. Well, Where did his wife come from? That's a big question. Well, the the religionist, the typical point of view is that Adam and Eve was the first human being, and lo and behold, they had Cain and Abel, and then Cain kills Abel, and then down in chapter 4, verse 17, it says Cain Cain lay with his wife. Well, the average pastor will say, oh, well, you see, Adam and Eve kept on having babies and babies and babies and babies, and the brothers married the sisters and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Cain probably just slept with his his unnamed sister or his unnamed niece or something like that. Well, maybe that's the case, but I don't think so. Um, I think... There's missing information here, obviously. Now, both sides of the fence, myself included, plus religion, is speculating on this. Because the information's not here. It's just not here. There's no way for us to know what happened here. And the strange thing is, later, Cain, it says, Cain was then building a city that he named after his son Enoch. Now, 
isn't it strange that he would build a city? So we can speculate again. We can say there are centuries that went by between between the time um, Cain and Abel were born and all these other offspring that were supposedly on the earth. And centuries went by and there was a mass of people and suddenly they had a need for a city. But again, the whole story is so incomplete that it's impossible, I say, to say with absolute certainty what's going on here. But I'll put it this way. Over the years, I've had to look other places for what I consider to be the real answers to the big questions in life. And... um, We all have a different point of view on things, and I don't ever try to enforce my perspectives on on this sort of thing. But this is very strange indeed. It's strange that it would even have a concept of what a city is. I mean, if this was really the third human being um, to be born on the whole earth, where did they get a concept of a city? Where did all these people come from? Where did his wife come from. But, um, you know, we're really talking about the Billy Meyer case today and all the writings of Edward Albert Meyer. And the Meyer information, what it says is that there is a universal consciousness, uh, super intelligence. It's kind of impersonal in, in a sense. It's not a heavenly father. It radiates love much like the sun in our solar system radiates light and heat, but it doesn't do that as a personal favor or because of its personal love for anybody. It does that because that's its nature. And that's the way the universal consciousness is. The incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. Another quote from the Meyer material. Um, so there's a super intelligence that creates, created all things. It's kind of impersonal. It's neutral positive. It's not a heavenly father. It didn't create a heaven or a hell. What it has, though, is a process called reincarnation, which is another creational natural law. Now, your your spiritual consciousness is what reincarnates. Remember I said at the beginning of the show, You have a material consciousness and a spiritual consciousness. Your psyche controls the thoughts and the feelings of your material consciousness. Your spirit form has a controlling factor which is called the gemut. And inside the gemut are the controlling factor of the spiritual consciousness. The spirit form is is the part of you which lives many, many lives. What happens at death is the spirit form leaves the body and it takes with it the material consciousness. Your material consciousness is your personality, your intellect, your subconscious, your unconscious. Your conscious mind, it takes that into what's called the spiritual realm, which is this band of energy which resides around our planet, And there's something called the overall consciousness block. Your consciousness goes in there, and all of your past life memories are then kind of processed. And what happens is these thoughts and memories and feelings are reduced to their essence, the most important aspect of what you learned in terms of hope and love and patience and all these virtues are are brought down to their spiritual essences. And those essences are what's absorbed by the spirit form. The spirit form is strengthened in this process. And it becomes more wise and more powerful. It's supposed to take a lifetime and a half on the spiritual side, on a spirit realm, before that spirit form incarnates into the body of a child at 21 days. When that happens, that enlivens this fetus 
and it becomes a living being. Its heart begins to beat. And in the subconscious of the new material consciousness, a new mentality of this child is the memories of the previous lifetimes. They are generally not accessible, which is a good thing. Because it would be very confusing at our level of evolution to have too much information from previous lives. Right now, we'll get impulses and hunches um, that will guide us. Because even though you're a, you're a baby, again, when you're born, your material consciousness is at the level of a child, but your spirit form is at the last evolutionary point that it was in the previous life. And stored in the subconscious are the essences of all these virtues that you got from your previous evolution. You see, the purpose of all these lifetimes, and there's millions of years of incarnations that occur, is to gather wisdom and to evolve our consciousness. And wisdom is a kind of knowledge that produces energy. And when you evolve you're going to have a positive impact on all those around you. You see, our mandate is to live and help live, and that's what we're doing on the earth here, is we're evolving our consciousness. And that's why it takes many lifetimes. There are seven stages of evolution that a human goes through. We here on earth are stuck down here on level two, well, first stage is um, primitive. The second stage is called rational life. The third stage is intelligent life. Part of us are slowly moving into the intelligence phase. Fourth stage is real life. Fifth stage is creation of wisdom. Sixth stage is this half spiritual, half physical stage, which, which lasts a long time. And then in the seventh stage, we're purely physical, and we start to merge back with this universal consciousness. This whole process takes several billion years. The Meyer material says the spirit forms on the earth are generally about four to five million years old. However, there are some spirit forms that are eight to 12 million years old. These are spirit forms which came to the earth from the depths of space. Um, these beings that we uh, hear in our ancient writings are not gods per se. They're not the creator of the universe, as is described here about um, Jehovah. The Meyer material talks about Jehovah. And Jehovah was one of a group of... Um, extraterrestrial humans that were here in the ancient past, um, they can probably be traced back to 11,500 years ago um, because that's the last pole shift. According to Meyer information, I think we the last pole shift was about 11,500 years ago when the Lemurians slammed a asteroid into the earth as revenge against the Atlanteans who destroyed um, Mu. And then, of course, this, this great war took place on the earth in the ancient past uh, during the time of Atlantis and Lemuria. And this was about 130,000 years ago. According to Meyer information, um, even as far back as 150,000 years ago, there was a group of extraterrestrial humans who came here. Uh, they were led by a guy named Pelagon. Pelagon brought about 70,000 human beings and, and several large, what we would call motherships, and they brought these to the earth. He also had 200 very good scientists with him. Uh, I believe they were actually from the Pleiaran star system. And um, they traveled through space and time, and they eventually got here to the earth. And Pelagon was a great leader. 
and they lived in a very high state of development for about 10,000 years. And then after Pelagon died, another man took over who wasn't so benevolent and wasn't so wise. And eventually uh, there was a great war, and uh, the earth was in a horrific state. Um, a small group of people, extraterrestrial humans, remained on the earth. But these people degenerated quickly, and they became kind of wild. Um, and then the earth, you know, the earth was in a very weird state. It took, like I believe, 7,000 years for the earth to recover from this, this great disaster that had occurred. And then, about 130,000 years ago, these people, uh, they came here from Beta Centauri. And this was the Atlanteans. And Atlant was their leader, and he was married to a queen of wisdom named Karyatide. And then these people were of Lyrian descent. And I, I'm really delving into this whole history thing again, which I've done many, many times on this show, probably too many times. Um, this is a, a history that goes beyond the 6,000 years ago of our Bible. I believe what's described in Genesis and in particular in, in Numbers 31-7 where all of the uh, Midianites are being killed by the um, army of Israel uh, the, when, when under the commands of Jehovah. Um, they kill the, 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 the men, the women and children of the Midianites, and they kept the virgins for themselves. Well, there's a similar kind of thing that is occurring uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. And here it... Um, it says, well, I'll just read this here. It says, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Now, that's a ghastly thought. That, that would have to mean the animals, too. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. See, the Meyer material says Jehovah was one of these people called the Giza Intelligences, which can be traced back to about 11,500 years ago. Uh, there was a guy named Eris XI, who was one of the descendants, uh, 11 generations uh, from, from Eris the Barbarian, who was the guy that got the Great War started between Atlantis and Lemuria. And then I believe Eris XI had a son, Jehave, Jehave had a son, Jehovan. Jehovan had a son, Erisam. Erisam went far below the Giza Plateau. And the Meyer material said the Giza structure there is about 73,000 years old. And there's this old cubicle construction far, far below it. And that's where these Giza intelligences went. And Erisam um, was thrown out of power by his nephew, um, who was known as Hen, but he was called Jehovah by the Hebrews. And the Meyer material says Jehovah was one of these extraterrestrial humans in this lineage of people that had come back to the earth after Atlantis and Lemuria had fell. And these people were trying to gain power over the earth. And one of the things they did was use religion to gain control over people. And one of these brutal leaders in this lineage of leaders, where the, fa the, the father was generally killed by the son after several centuries. These people lived a long time. And then finally we got to Jehovah. Jehovah was eventually um, died as well. And then we had a guy named Kamigal the I and then a, another guy, Kamigal the Second. So this is this whole lineage of people that, uh, these people are dead now. Uh, the the Bafath, as they're called, or the Giza intelligences have been pushed off the earth. But it, just this is, again, the Meyer information, is as best as I understand it, is that the story of the God of the Hebrews is the story of one of these extraterrestrial humans in this lineage of extraterrestrial humans that was trying to set up a world-dominating 
power structure and put themselves on top of it. And it, it, it starts to make sense when you start to understand why would the creator of the universe be saying things like um, kill everything that breathes. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to fall all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So in other words, the Meyer information is saying this was not the creator of the universe that was commanding Israel to wipe out, to do this genocide. This is one of these brutal dictators from the Giza intelligences. Now, who knows, right? I mean, who who really knows? I mean, I just try to be as neutral as, as I can about this thing. But if you accept the Jehovah as the creator of the universe, then you have to try to logically understand and justify why he would require people to go in murder other people, particularly men and women and children, and then take their virgins for for themselves, as it says in uh, Numbers uh, 31.7. So um, I'm just putting forth a different point of view on things, a different perspective. There's probably some merit in this perspective. I cannot uh, prove it. However, I can say that it makes it a lot easier to understand. It makes it a lot more logical. Um, if we could really date the stones of the Great Pyramids, we could date the stones of structures like Machu Picchu and Puma Punku, I think we would find that the Meyer material is correct, that these structures go back tens of thousands, 70,000 years ago in case... In the case of the old Great Pyramid, 73,000 years ago. And the Meyer information explains that they were built with a lot of work of human beings and animals, but the understanding of how to build these structures came from people who came here from a great distance, who had the ability to come here from the stars. I mean, some of them came from neighboring solar systems, but there was one group that the Meyer material says came from Beta Centauri. And the people from Beta Centauri um, were called, when in the ancient Arabic, their star, that star, Beta Centauri, was called Hadar, which means civilization, which means on the ground, and it also means Another word was used for that star, which means to kneel. So I think there were some people on Earth that were kneeling before these extraterrestrial humans who were here. And that's why our understanding is now marred. Our psyche has a tremendous scar on it. And now we have this documentation of this brutal dictator who we have to somehow merge with our concept of God. And that's why uh, the Meyer material um, um, says there is no God in that sense, that the universal consciousness should not and cannot be called God because God is an anthropomorphic thought system that came on the earth um, and there were gods on the earth. There were human beings who had high technologies and tremendous powers in their material consciousness who could do things that we just could not believe today. So that is why we have the confusion in our religion. I want to read something from Contact Report 31, and this comes from Billy's second contact, Ask It, a woman from the Tao universe. And if you ever... If you uh, read Contact 31, it's quite amazing. It's Billy's trip in the mothership, and I want to thank Gemini for telling me that he could hear me 
and uh, say hello to Captain Marco Hawk and Guest 505. Anyway, I put the link in the chat room for Contact 31, and you see some blurry pictures of the mothership, which is pretty pretty cool too. Uh, in Contact 31, Ask it says they have this only partially, like everything that is evolving. Often behind these contacts lurk collective human subconsciousness forms, etc. But also a very great danger, which unfortunately the Earth humans will only be able to recognize after evil wars and catastrophes have befallen them. So ask you to start and talk about our collective subconscious. We have a collective subconscious that has been very much influenced by our religion. It has affected us very deeply. Let me con- continue here. Often... Uh, Okay, in many cases, powerful leaders on the earth have also subconsciously been maliciously influenced by such collective human subconscious intelligences. And as desired, trigger death and destruction, ignorance, doom, deception, hatred, and annihilation. So there have been these malicious leaders on the earth who are also connected to this collective subconscious. Let me continue. This in political as well as religious areas. However, individuals are also affected by these malicious collective subconscious forces. So religion is part of the malicious subconscious force that affects all people. You see, people are struggling for answers, and they turn to religions because religions appear to have the answers. But what is really going on there is a subconscious force that is very negative. Let me continue. And as a consequence then, in delusion or delusional belief, they commit murders, suicides, and mass murders and trigger catastrophes. Now, we see the murders and such from radical Islam. So that's real obvious. But there's more to this than just... um, suicides from these cults and stuff. Let me continue. These human beings who are influenced by such collective subconscious intelligence, respectively, collective subconscious forces belong, however, and without exception, to sectarian religious beliefs, which constitute the main breeding ground. So these religions today that are on the earth, whether it's radical Islam, whether it's the information in our Old Testament, is transmitting a kind of delusional um, thing across the earth. It's a breeding ground for this. These earth humans will be approached through the collective subconsciousness forms in the form that they are transmitted. The delusion that God personally, Christ or Satan, has issued them the command for murder, war, or suicide. And that's just what we saw in, uh, I think it was Deuteronomy 20, when it's written down that the Lord told them to go and kill all these people, the Jebusites, and we got the one example from the Midianites from um, Numbers 31.7. If the human would finally get rid of his deadly sex and religion, then this misleading or malicious collective subconscious intelligence, respectively subconscious forces, would lose their suggestive power over him because where truth and logic and the compliance with the crave laws prevail, evil can no longer assert itself. So let me explain this a little bit. Um, if you start to comply to these creational natural laws, like love, like striving, like the law of harmony, then you'll stay in a neutral positive focus And your life will have this very, very pleasant momentum associated with it. Not that there won't be adversity, but you will not be affected by all these negative forms that are out there. And uh, it's a very good thing, particularly the law of striving, which is a hard one sometimes to focus on, but it's very, very important. Let me continue. But since these malicious human collective subconscious intelligence are wherever this they very skillfully control and direct the lives of sex and religions. And they even understand how to provocate the madness of religions and sex and to push the earth humans more and more to an evil 
religious sectarian fanaticism. So I can go on and on here. This is very profound stuff. Contact 31 um, from Ask It. So probably there are some people who have come to this show who have no idea who Billy Meyer is and no idea who Ask It are. So let me let me give a kind of a brief overview of the very unusual life of Edward Albert Meyer. He He's in his late 70s. He lives in a town in Switzerland, a tiny mountain village called Hinterschmidruti, which is about 52 minutes east from Zurich. Um, his contacts started back in about 1945 when a man named Spoth, who was from a star system beyond our Pleiades, uh, they were these people were called the Pleiadians for years, but they're not from our Pleiades. They are from the Pleiaren star system, which is about 80 light years beyond our Pleiades, about 500 light years. They're very, very advanced. They have an incredible technology. They're from a different space-time configuration, which I find very complicated. Uh, there are not only two or three hundred billion stars at least in our galaxy, but there are different space-time configurations, which you can roughly equate to a dimension. Thoth was from a planet called Era, which is very Earth-like, uh, and that's the other big shocker, is there are Earth-like planets out there, and there are civilizations on these planets. And that the universal consciousness creates things according to a pattern. And there are repeating patterns in nature. And we have the circulatory system of the human being that has a branching structure. A lightning bolt coming out of the sky has a branching structure. Trees have a branching structure. So there's commonality in the universe. There is a, the spiraling arms of the Milky Way, there's the spiraling arms of the DNA, there's a spiral on a seashell, there's a spiral that forms in rivers that flow naturally. These are repeating patterns because it's the same intelligence which created all this. It applied the same logic when it built our planet as it will apply to other planets. So well, the thing we're going to find out someday is that, oh my goodness, there are other planets out there, and they've got plants very similar to ours, animals similar to ours, and some of them have people on them. You know, they may be taller, they may be shorter, they may have different color skin. But what we have is a commonality across the universe. The extraterrestrials are not as they're depicted on Independence Day. I've seen both of them. I enjoy their shows. But they are really nonsense. What we have on other planets are people like us at different ev levels of evolution. Now, the point, the evolution that people can get to is astonishing. And I talked about the second stage of evolution well, there's a fifth stage of evolution, which I mentioned briefly, called life and creational wisdom. And those people from the player and star system, some of them have reached this fifth stage. And they have incredible powers. They have incredible abilities and incredible understanding. Now, the man that first met with Billy was a man named Spoth. And his pear-shaped silvery spacecraft would appear and slowly, slowly come to the ground, and then Billy would get the telepathic message, and he would walk over to the ship. Sloth brought him up on the ship and started to tell him about his future life and also told, about, told him about his previous lives, that he had been the people who we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And that he had taught this ancient universal teaching 
that talks about the creation of natural laws, that talks about the law of reincarnation, and that talks about the fact that we have a tremendous power to our thoughts, that teaches that we're all connected, that there is a oneness to the universe. There is a oneness to all things. And there is um, a great article called The Source of the Oneness of the Universe. It's one of the Maya writings. It says, the whole universe is a oneness which flows through all things, all existence and all life in the universe. The human being who has distinct needs. You see, we all have needs. And this universal oneness responds to our needs. It responds to the positive thoughts and the feelings to the positive word pronounced. And we're told to think in a neutral, positive way. Because if you do that, you start to open yourself up to the wellspring of the oneness of the universe. You see, the neutral, positive thought form is what puts us in balance with the universe. And so our thoughts if they go out neutral positive, they'll come back even strengthened, more neutral positive. And it says here, the oneness of the universe which gushes for you and out of which forms a rich stream upon you, which you set sail your whole life long. It says, open up your thoughts and your feelings to that neutral positive, the law of harmony. You see, everything in the universe is one and it's all united in a way we don't understand yet you see I was talking about the collective subconscious of the human beings and how when the delusional belief goes into the sub the sub collective subconscious it affects other people because we're all connected in ways we don't understand yet so the best thing that you can do is learn this wisdom to keep yourself free of the negative collective subconscious influences and to start to understand this primary creational natural law, which is love. In the figure material, love is discussed, and it becomes clear that the love that is discussed is not the mushy, grasping, romantic, humanitarian type love that we talk about. You can think of love as affective or effective. The my material really focuses on effective love. Affective love is romantic. It is characterized by its transient nature, and that means it comes and goes and it can have a lot of despair associated with it. That's not really what love is. That's a false form of love. That's the kind of love we earth humans focus on. Effective love, on the other hand, is based on our innermost being. And when we start to understand that we are connected to all things, that when you see the tree, you see almost like a connection to yourself. Uh, whenever there's unnecessary death, and I call sometimes the earth the planet of unnecessary death, because we have so much of it, because we we neglect, you know, we don't take care of our elderly, we don't take care of our vets, we don't take care of the planet, and then we're we're constantly killing. Uh, just just look at the animals that are killed on the roads as you drive. It's just horrific because we don't understand the oneness of the universe. And our population is just growing out of control. I mean, you know, we're we're going to get into what's called exponential population growth very soon. And um, as a quick example, if, if you had two chickens in your one acre yard and those chickens um, start
start to populate exponentially. In other words, after one year, you've got four chickens. So that's two years, you've got four chickens. In three years, you've got uh, eight chickens. In four years, you've got 16 chickens. In five years, you've got 32 chickens. In 16 years, you've got 64 chickens. 64 chickens in your acre lot. A ain't going to be able to handle much more. And the next year, you'll have 128 chickens. Well, you really can't even survive uh, with 100 chickens on an acre. So that's what's happening on the earth. That's one of the issues with exponential growth. But if we started to understand the creational natural laws of everything being in balance, we wouldn't let our population overwhelm the earth. Because as the earth, as the humanity on the earth gets more teeming and more teeming and more teeming, we're going to destroy more and more forest. And as we destroy the forest, in our ignorance, we don't realize that we're all connected. It's all oneness. So that forest was for centuries moderating our weather. Now we've destroyed and we continue to destroy more and more. And our weather becomes more and more extreme. Fires, storms, snow, hot, cold, droughts, all this because we've destroyed creation. So we've come to the point on the earth where it's it's very important that we start to understand these creational natural laws. I'm talking about, for example, effective love. Effective love, which understands the incredible splendor of nature, is the visible expression of the love of creation, and that love is the highest principle in creation. And everything follows that principle in absolute logic. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. But only man can turn away from love. And to him, the world feels like a place without love. And that's when his thinking is no longer neutral positive. It's no longer within the law of harmony. You see, we have a spiritual consciousness, and our spirit form is powering that spiritual consciousness. And what controls the thoughts and the feelings of our spiritual consciousness is this thing called the gamut, which sends this swinging wave to the psyche, and it powers the psyche with this energy from the cosmic electromagnetic realm of life which is what creation is it's this seething spiritual energy that has bursted out in a a great bang and the, the universe is expanding at this incredible rate and it's been expanding for 46 trillion years and expands for about 155 trillion years And then it starts to contract. The purpose of your life is evolution, the evolution of your consciousness. You live many lives. There is no hell after death. There is no heaven. You will reincarnate on the earth with a new personality, with a new material consciousness, with the same spiritual consciousness that you had in your previous life. And locked in your subconsciousness will be all of those memories. And you have the opportunity once again to gather the wisdom from that lifetime, to have the knowledge formed into these essences which will be stored in your spirit form. True love is true being, and it is the everlasting warmth from the center of creation. You know, when Billy was a young boy, one of the first things he did when he was about three or four years old, it was in May, a warm night in May, and he crawled out um, 
a lower window in his bedroom and sat down on a bench. And he looked up at a beautiful starry sky in May. And he said some very profound things for a young boy. He said, my life exists because of the love of creation. And my life is made out of the love of creation. And he recognized that there was a light in the visible spectrum which he could see from the stars, but that there was an invisible light which remained invisible. That was the true love of creation. And that all of creation is connected by this love. And he also learned that that we learn the truth in our innermost thoughts, in our innermost feelings, in our innermost contemplations. And he developed the recognition and the the application of self-responsibility. And that's one of the things we have to learn is self-responsibility. And we have a responsibility to our fellow human beings, to the world of plants and animals, and in regard to life, and these creational laws and recommendations, which are here to help us live uh, an abundant life. There is a oneness and a connectedness with all and everything, and it is a result of the might and the immeasurable love of creation, which gives everything selflessly and demands no payment The biggest problem of human beings here on the earth is our ignorance of of the creation, of its laws, of its recommendations. And because of our lack of understanding that there is a oneness to the universe, we, we think that we don't understand the importance of every little factor in creation. Every tiny plant, every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love, and the love of creation is everywhere because without it, nothing at all would be able to exist. The individual should therefore be aware that we exist only through the love of creation, and we carry this love within ourselves. Creation created everything in logic and love, And that's one of the things that I want to emphasize is that creation has an incredible logic associated to it. It's not illogical. There's nothing in the universe that is illogical except the human being when he's trying to develop. You see, we're still evolving, we're trying to develop, and we're making big mistakes. So we act illogically. And we do things... um, that have horrific uh, ramifications when we don't realize that. I just thought of nuclear power, for example. I thought of the roads and the way we're destroying so much life just by our roads. So many animals die. So much habitat is destroyed. Uh, Thousands and thousands of cars on our expressways. And we don't understand our interconnectedness to all things. And that the entire universe, everything is one, and it's all bound together. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the show, folks. Uh, My name is Mark Snyder. This is Ohio Exopolitics. We like to bring to you the wisdom of the Meyer teachings. I hope you have a good day. We'll try to be back again tomorrow. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.